how you guys just got that secret in class information on the midterm. Uh, now we'll freak everyone else out who's listening online and we will continue. Okay, so we've seen that a type system, right? So a type system, a developer has specific types and um, a, a type system defines basic types, right? And then the type system also allows the programmer to create and construct new types using these uh, using these basic types. So here we have some types that are declared based on we're defining type centimeter as an integer, we're defining an RGBA as an array of zero to four of ints, and we're defining a PNG as an array of RGBAs. And the important thing where we left off what we were talking about is specifically types, and types with no names, right? So anonymous types are types that have no name, right? So, so for y here, y is a variable here. The type of y is a structure that has a field in a and another field character b. But what's the name of the type of y? There isn't one, yes. It's anonymous. It has no name, right? The difference would be if we declared some type called foo, and we said the foo is a structure like this, and then we said y is a foo, then we know y has a, y's type has a name called foo. So this becomes important when we start talking about, well, how do we decide if two types are compatible or not, right? How do we know if, if two types, so for instance, when we do assignment, right, what is allowed by the type system and what's disallowed by the type system? So for instance, can I do A equals B? <coughs> well, just by looking at this, you have no idea if, if this works, right? Yeah, right, so what if A is an int and B is a float? Do you do that? No. One is more extensive than the other. Well, it depends. Because you can truncate the float. Doesn't it depend on what's allowed in your system? Yeah, so this is the big thing, right? So uh, in C, is this allowed? I think so. I think so. You get, you get that loss of precision. I think it just trunks it. Truncates it, wouldn't it? I actually don't. I think it would work. I don't think you can go from a float to an int without a specific cast. I think you can do it and do the specific cast because you're losing, is that right? Yeah, you're losing information going from B to A, right? You're losing the so You could do it the other way around C. What was that? You could do into float and C. Yes. Because it's so, just exactly. So then if we flip them, right? So we say A is a float and B is an int. I don't know if this would work. Would it, can a float hold up to 2 to the 32 or 2 to the 31 integers? Test it. Yes? Test it. I'm going to create that real quick. <laughs> yeah, actually test this. Uh, the important point is, right, is that it really doesn't matter because the type system itself has to define if this is allowed and good. And A, if it's allowed, and B, what are the exact semantics of doing this, right? In some cases, it makes sense, right? Like uh, assigning a character to an int makes sense because a character can only be uh, eight is only eight bits, right? So it's two to the eight. So we can store that value inside an int. But whether we actually want to allow a programmer to do that, because from the type system, characters and ints are different things, right? I mean, if you think about it logically, right? Maybe why would I want to treat a character? an element as part of a string as an integer, right? Seems kind of weird. Okay, so type compatibility. Type compatibility is the rules about what's allowed and type inference allows us to say what are the types of expressions or some other constructs. So how do we infer types, right? So this is exactly what you're doing in project four, right? For project four, you're automatically inferring the types of variables in your program based on their usage. But the compiler has to do this as well for other types of expressions. 
right? So like, what's the type of A plus B? Integer. Right now we don't have any. It's an assumption. Yeah, we have no idea. We don't know anything about the types, but there must be a type of A plus B, right? Because you can assign that to another variable, and you want to know if that if that type checks. So there needs to be the expression a plus b, right, has to return some type. And so if uh, a is an int and b is a float, what's this going to return? So is a is this going to type check? What do you mean by type check? Is it allowed by the type system? No. Yeah. Well, it depends. It depends on what rules. <laughs> in c, yeah. In the, pro in the project, it's not. Correct, in the project it's not, but what about C? Yeah. yeah. In C it is. It is, and what is it, but what's the type that it returns? What is it? Float. Float? Yeah, so it's automatically gonna uh, convert that int to a float and then return a float. But in other languages like uh, ML or OCaml, this will actually throw an error. You can't add an int and a float together. Uh, you have to explicitly convert from an int to a float. So is this, I don't know, is this good? Do you think that would be a huge pain? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. But could it prevent errors, right, where you mistakenly are adding a float to an int, but you really didn't want to do that, you thought that A should have been a float itself, or, right? So this, there's this very weird trade-off between when things are implicit like this and just work, like A plus B, well, you're, yes, it's easier in some sense to write a program, but it could cause errors in your programs. What about, you know, A times B? Should work. Mm -hmm. If A is an int and B is a float, what does it return? What would it return? Probably a float again. What if A is a string and B is an int? Nope. You said in Python you can do that. I did say it. Right? So it depends on the language, right? Because the language has to define what does this mean. You can do that in Python. Yeah, it's an error in most languages and returns a string in Python, which still bugs me. It's actually really useful, but it's super annoying because it doesn't make any sense conceptually. Like, why why a string multiplied by an integer means repeat that string that many times? Like that, yeah. Just out of curiosity, why would you want to do that in Python? Oh, uh, <laughs> I do it... Um, when you're doing like security testing and stuff and you want to see how big like a buffer is, you want to pass input to a program and you give it consecutively larger and larger inputs. Oh. And so with this, you can use just like an A times whatever number and you can just keep increasing that number to get more and more input. Okay. Or, so it actually is really handy in those cases, but these are one of those really weird corner cases where yeah, you just, it doesn't make the code any more readable, right? <laughs> Especially if you have variables, right? If it's A times 10, Okay, then maybe I know A is a string, but. Uh. <coughs> and JavaScript's even worse. You can do this in JavaScript. Uh, I believe it will try to figure out, it'll try to look at A, see if it can convert A to an integer, and then do the multiplication. So it'll actually try to see if you pass the value as like, if the string is, of A is 10, it'll interpret that as the integer 10, and then do 10 times B. Um, and then if not, it, I, I don't know if it returns zero or not a number or something crazy, so. Okay. So, and we've seen this is kind of a, so this is just about type, type inference saying that the expressions, right, have to have some sort of type, right? That way you can make sense of them. This is why in project four when we say something plus something, so for plus it's defined for everything with integers, uh, with ints, right? Something, an int plus an int returns an int, right? That's the type of that expression. So that's part of type inference. Okay. So the main question we want to answer with type compatibility is, are these two types equivalent? Right? So let's look at some examples to try to understand, well, this seems like a trivial problem, right? I mean, really easy to see if two things are equal, right? So uh, let's say we have a centimeter, a type centimeter. So we're defining, we're constructing a new type called centimeter that's defined as an integer. And we're defining a new type inch that's defined as an integer. 
And we have a variable x, which type is centimeter, and variable y, whose type is inch. So we can say, can we say x equals y? Yes, they're both yeah. integers. Yes, but they're general and I go that way. Types are not. Right. So not I want arguments for one side or the other. So should you be able to do this, and if so, why? Or should you not be able to do it? Yeah. I'm going to say no, because at the time of type checking, it's going to look at x and say, this is a centimeter, and look at inch and say, or y and say, this is an inch. They're not the same. Can't assign. OK. But I mean, the like, OK, when you characters work like that, though, because a character is the underlying type of a character is an int, right? It's a byte, actually. Does it's only it's because it's a smaller int. So okay. it's eight bits, whereas a oh, integer is usually 32 bits. Mm -hmm. But there are, are there primitive types that have like underlying types? Uh, float and int are both 32 bits. OK. So I mean, in this case, they are the same underlying type, so they should be able to. So you should be able to do this? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, unless it's like mission critical, in which case. Unless it's mission critical, <laughs> then you don't want it to happen? Well, yeah. So the compiler should know that this is mission critical code, and then so. Well, <coughs> in most languages, those two are not types, so like, I guess the person defining them should should have a way to make them une unequivalent. I don't think you should be able to do this because centimeters and inches are not the same thing. So if you set centimeter equal to inch, it's just not going to be right. For example, if we have one inch and set x equal to it, it's still not actually one inch. It's one centimeter. Yeah. So what would you what do you want to happen as a programmer? Yeah. Not. Wait, as a uh, responsible programmer. <laughs> 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 what, what other kind of programmer are you? Are you an irresponsible <laughs> programmer? Like I mean, you can make it do the conversion for you. That's true. You can make it do the conversion for you. Interesting. Well, that just depends on how the assignment operator works under the hood. <clears throat> yeah. Um, question about the potential of a test. Um, like, when you ask something like, is this valid? Like, x equals y? And like, do you want us to answer that question yes or no? see the different types of type equivalents, and then so I'll ask, hey, would this be equivalent in name equivalents and structural equivalents and the different types of equivalents? Um, <coughs> yeah, anybody else have any other thoughts on whether you'd want this or not want this? Well, so this kind of goes back to the, the question we asked earlier, you know, int to float, float to int. Only one of those is actually supported, and that's more, that's more a language-specific thing. Right. So in this, in this case, I mean, in, in that case, an int and a float are both numbers. So they're, they're easily convertible. I mean, an inch, and a, an inch and a centimeter are not, they're both measurements, but they're both very different numbers. They have different conversions. Are they easily convertible, though? They are easily convertible, but that has to be supported by the language. There you go, yeah. We don't so, know if it's supported by So the there's a couple of issues at play here, right? One is the developer is creating these new types, right? Um, so. Yeah, I agree with, actually you guys have touched on a lot of issues, right? So I agree with, from a, the programmer's perspective, this should not, we do not want this to just happen, right? We don't want to be able to just, one inch is not the same thing as one centimeter, even though to the underlying system it's representing it as integers, right? I mean, to the underlying system, everything's ones and zeros, right? So then we don't need a type system. So uh, this helps us not shoot ourselves in the foot because here we can actually define a new type as centimeter, right? And we know that anytime we assign it, we're only assigning centimeters to centimeters, right? As opposed to being able to accidentally assign inches or feet or whatever other kind of value we have. Um, actually, the the comment on automatic conversion is actually very good. There's um, languages like Scala do, uh, you can define new types and then you can define it will actually, I think if it sees something like this, it'll try to look and see if there's a function that will re uh, take in an inch and return a centimeters. And so it'll try to automatically convert for you 
uh, between those two values. I think maybe you have to specify exactly what those functions are, but um, yeah, it's kind of nice because you can say, you can use this, and that way anytime you use a centimeter or an inch, you don't have to worry about the conversion between the two. I also feel like that could backfire rather magnificently if you weren't, <laughs> if you weren't thinking too hard about it. <laughs> Lots like, of things can backfire. Well, if you're not I mean, I'm hard. just like if you don't, if it, if it if it's trying to use the wrong function or you've de previously defined a function incorrectly, I mean you can be digging through. Oh yeah, it's kind of the same argument against uh, C plus plus and operator overloading, right? When you look at a program, it's really hard to know what functions are going to get called because this equal sign may actually be some really complicated function that gets called and uh, all these other things. Uh, actually, that also brought up a good point, right? So centimeter, can you actually convert from centimeters to inches without losing precision? Not as an integer. Not as an integer, right, which is how they're defined. So that's another interesting point. So the main thing is, this is trying to get you to think about, well, what does the language do, and how is that good for me, the programmer, right? Is this actually the behavior that I want? So we're going to look at, uh, I believe, three, maybe I why you should never number things. Uh, yeah, okay, we're gonna look at some different types of type equivalents. Uh, so the first one is the very kind of easiest example, and it's name equivalents. So just using your powers of inductive reasoning, what would you think it's gonna check for to say that two types are equivalent? It's the name of the type is equivalent, yes. So they must have the exact same name to be equivalent. So in this case, if we have a centimeter and an inch, and we say can x equal y, would this be allowed with name equivalents? No. No, because it's checking the exact names of x and y, and say, OK, the type of y is inch, the type of y is <coughs> centimeter, those are not the same type, therefore, this is an error. We can't do this. Do you want us to print out an error? Do I want you to print out an error? Uh, no, I want you to know how to use this name equivalence to be able to look at type definitions and say whether two types are equivalent or not equivalent. So where does this? So this seems very straightforward, right? Nod. Everyone nod. <laughs> okay. okay. Where is it tricky? So there's one thing that we talked about in this sentence. So let's think about it this way. Do all types have names? No. Un unnamed types. Not unnamed types. Close. Okay. Anonymous types. That's the yeah, that's the specific word for that. So we want to look at, OK, let's look at another example. So let's say we have A, which is an array 0 to 4 event, B, an array of 0 to 4 event. So we want to say is, OK, so ah, yes, we're declaring a variable A that's an array 0 to 4 event. We're declaring an array B of array 0 to 4 event. So is this allowed, A equals B? You don't know because there's no name. Well, we have to <coughs> make an argument for one way or the other based on what we just learned about name equivalence. No. <coughs> no? Why no? <laughs> I think it is. Well, thinking about this in terms of C, A and B are just pointers, so we're just assigning the pointer. I don't think about it in C. All right. <laughs> well, I want to think about it a bit more abstractly using what we just so. Well, not, neither of them have names, so technically they're equal. Mm, I guess that is the philosophical point. Okay. <laughs> Types must have the exact <laughs> same name to be equivalent. This is what type name equivalence means, right? The types must have the exact same name. So, we have, what are the types of A and B? Race size four. What kind of. Uh, um, Could the signature be the name? What's the name of the type of A? Yeah. yeah. Does the um, size of the array, is that part of the name of the type? 
It's the, yes, it's part of the type. Okay. Yes. So the type of array specifically has uh, the size or the range we call it, and then the type of each of the elements of the array. So they're both in. Close, yeah. So there, these are both anonymous types, right? So the type of A is anonymous. The type of B is anonymous. What does it mean for something to be anonymous? It has no name. So if it has no name, can can it have the exact name as something else? Well, if it's no. no. Well, technically, there's they're 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 not a name, and not a name is equal to a not another name. So I guess. <laughs> It, it really just depends on how you define it. It does, but I'm trying to get us to think. <laughs> You're fishing for a specific answer. Yeah, I mean, but it, you know, if somebody was uh, an anonymously wrote, let's say, feedback to me or something, right, mm -hmm. on your reviews, if I get two pieces of anonymous feedback, I wouldn't say, aha, these are the same person. How do you know? Right? I don't, but I can't <laughs> assume that they are, right? This, this says they have to be exactly the same name. All right. Right. So if I have two types with no name, they could be the same, but they could not be the same. So we, so we, in in the case of anonymous typing, we have to assume that they're not the same unless specifically this defined yes. as the same. Yes. specifically for name equivalent. Okay. So name equivalents, they have to have exactly the same name. They don't have names, so therefore you can't do equivalents on things that have no names. Okay. That makes sense. All right. So this is not allowed under name equivalents, right? But is this what you want from your type system? Sometimes. But not really enough. What was that? No? It's not enough. It's not, it's not enough? And not enough in what sense? Not enough capability. So we would, I would like the ability to say that these two arrays are the same type. So it needs to be able to figure out that, oh, no, wait. Even though they don't have names, they're, when you look at it, they're the same. By right. some sort of signature. Right. So it's. The thing is, yes, yeah, so they are they have no names, but they have, uh, well, okay, let's actually, we're going to look at some other things. We're going to get back to this uh, about, in some sense, the structure of them are the same, right? Okay, let's, okay, so on that example, right, we had A is an array, I'm just going to say array of int, right? So I have a variable A as an array of int. So what about, and here I had B is an array of int. Does the size not matter in this case? Uh, yeah, for space reasons, I'm not drawing the size. OK, so what if I declare, so we saw in project four, right, in a lot of programming languages, you can define a variable kind of on the same line, right? So you can say that. Well, I have variables, let's say, A and B, and the types of A and B are both uh, arrays of ints, right? So should A and B be, be equal here? They ought to be. Why? Because we define them on the same line. They're the same statement. Okay, so we define them on the same line, so they should be the same type. Right? I mean, we're saying, like, if we say, I don't know, x and y are both ints, right? We should say x is equal to y. Right? <coughs> A, so can we do this under name equivalence? Yes. With the integers, yes. Right, with x and y, yes, because the names are identical, right? The name is of the type is int, the ints are identical, yeah. Can you just give the type array of ints a name? Yes, so that's one way we could do it, definitely. So we could say, uh, like in our language, we can say foo, the type foo is an array of ints. And then I can say, well, a is a foo, and b is a foo, right? So then, can I say A is equal to B under name equivalence? Yes. Yes, because they have the same name, exactly. But what if we go back to this case? So does it make, so 
by name equivalence, right, what's the name of the type of A here? Anonymous. Doesn't have one. And the name of the type of B? Anonymous. Also anonymous, doesn't have one, under right? Name equivalence, we couldn't do it. So under name equivalence, we, could, we cannot do this, right? Absolutely. So that's an error. But does this make sense? Yes. Yes? Okay, it makes sense for a name equivalence, which is good. But is it what we want? No. No, right? Because we're defining these two. So what's the big difference between these two? They're independent statements versus one that's all together. Right, so here up top, I'm declaring a variable A, and then maybe 100, 1,000 lines later, right, I'm declaring some variable B with the type of array of int, and it just happens to be that they have the same type. But here, I'm declaring on the exact same line, I want two variables, and I specifically want them to have this type array of int. Yeah, right? That line says that they're both the same signature. Same type. The same anonymous type, right? So there's still no name here. But because these are declared on that same line, as a programmer, I'm basically telling the compiler, Seriously, these they're have the same, same type, right? <laughs> How could they not have the same type? Because they're defined on the same line, right? Uh, so this gets to the yes, okay. Uh, the next type of equivalence that we're going to talk about. So uh, we just saw, right? So under name equivalence, this is not allowed because this has no name. But it doesn't make any sense because we're defining variables multiple variables and we're saying these have exactly this type. Okay, and we saw this, we can say, we can do this, right, because we've both give, we've given a name to this array and so now we know, great, these are definitely the same type. Okay, so the next type of, of uh, type equivalence is internal name equivalence. And this is kind of a little bit peeling back the hood of the compiler just a little bit. Um, the basic idea is if the program interpreter, so the interpreter or compiler, would give the same internal name to two different variables, then they share the same type. And this specifically covers this case, right? So internally, just like you know you're doing project four, right? Internally, you have to have some way of representing the types, right? And so when you see a new anonymous type, you're creating some new type for that new anonymous type. So the compiler does exactly the same thing. When it sees this line, it sees, okay, new anonymous type array, and okay, A is also this type, and B is also this type, <coughs> right? Then when it sees this declaration C, <coughs> it's gonna create a new internal type for this array zero to four of it, right? Because it's an anonymous type, it's never seen it before, so it has to create some new type for it. So with internal name equivalence, now can I say A is equal to B? Yep. Yep. Why? Because internally, they're both array size 0 and 4. Or something. Yes. Internally, they have the same internal name. And we know that because they're declared on the exact same line. Right? And it actually follows more closely of what our intent as programmers are. Right? We're declaring that these are exactly the same on this line. So we should be able to do this. But can we do A is equal to C? No. No. No, right? Because the compiler is going to give this a completely different name because it's a brand new anonymous type that's never seen before. Questions on this? So internal name equivalence, uh, slightly more expressive than, or a little, I guess, less restrictive than name equivalence, right? So it allows you to do this. <coughs> Any questions here? 15 minutes, thanks. All right. Okay. But I guess we still have to ask the question, does this really make sense? That A and C, I can't assign them one to the other. Not really. Yeah, assume it's not what we wanted to do. They're the same. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense in some ways, right? It goes back to the same argument with inches and centimeters, right? Maybe I'm using these arrays for completely different purposes, right? And so I want them to never be able to assign to the other. But it also makes sense that, well, really, they're, they're the same things. They're structurally exactly the same, right? You could copy, 
you know, you know the size of each array, so you could copy every element from C to A, and then you successfully copied one to the other. So this is where we get to structural equivalence. So the idea is the compiler is going to try to try to determine if these types are structurally equivalent, so if they have the same structure. So we build this up. We have a series of rules, basically. Uh, so the first thing is, right, built-in types are the same. The same built-in types are structurally equivalent, right? Makes sense. That's kind of, if you think about this, this is a recursive definition, so this is our base case. Right? So at the end of the day, we're going to have built-in types. Then, any pointer to structurally equivalent types are structurally equivalent. Right? So in this case, in structural equivalence, right, I have centimeters, I have inches, these are both the same built-in type, right? So this is allowed in structural equivalence, which, as we'll see, gives us some nice properties, but kind of also hurts us in this way. So for pointers, right? So I have, yeah? Shouldn't the equivalence kind of be hierarchical, I guess? So the very first thing it looks for is your name equivalence, which in this case, it, it wouldn't pass. And then that's where it stops. But if it can't do name equivalence, then it goes to the internal internal type equivalence. And then, then it goes to the structural equivalence. If um, you, do that. you can think of it like that, but it's not, <coughs> not what's actually happening. I mean, so for two things to have the same name, they are going to be structural equivalent. And for two things that have an internal name, they're going to be structurally equivalent. True. Uh, so you can kind of think about it both ways, right? So the structural equivalence rules kind of imply those other ones, right? Or, sorry, the name equivalence implies structural equivalence. Uh, but yeah, that would be a good check, I guess, on a test or something to... So because they both have integer? Uh, but these are not name equivalent, right? So that actually doesn't show here. But if you have two integers, right? Two integers are name equivalent, and because they're name equivalent, they must have the same structure, right? And if two types are internal name equivalent, they also must have the same structure. So let's look at pointers. So if we have an int star a and a float star b, are these structurally equivalent? Yes. So we first have to peel this back, right? So we first check and we say, okay, A and B are both pointers, right? So that's structurally equivalent. But as we saw in this rule, pointers are structurally equivalent only if they point to the same, uh, point to structurally equivalent types. So, this works. so we see they're pointers, yes, okay. Uh, that's structurally equivalent. And then we see, okay, ah, but this is an int. So is an int structurally equivalent to a float? No, because only built-in types are structurally equivalent. Uh, so this would be not structurally equivalent because the int and float are not structurally equivalent. Okay. Now a big problem becomes, so basically what we're doing here, all these rules are going through all the type constructors, right? And saying, okay, here's how you create new types. Of, how you, here's how you construct new types, and here's how you can tell if the types are structurally equivalent. So now we need to, so how do we determine if two structs are structural equivalent? What do you think? What, what makes sense? Check a bunch of things. Name. Yeah, that's right. To, to look at the elements of the structure, or the struct, and see if they're the same. And if they are, then you treat it just like you did the pointer. Yeah, so <laughs> elements of structs are the same, right? So you would say, well, what about the elements of the struct? They need to be of the same type. Yeah. So you need uh, just the same type where you've got a bunch of ints on one and one int on the other. They're the same type. So that same type, same quantity, same <laughs> order. They need to be the same struct. Ooh, wow. So they, they, need pass, yeah. they need to pass. They need to pass. Well, what was that? 
Uh, I, I guess it had to be the same order if, if a struct is made of multiple primitive types. But even then, I don't know. I don't think they have to be the same order necessarily. And we assign structs type names, and that just handles this for us, because if they have the same type name, everything inside should be the same. Yes, so if they have the same name, then they're name equivalent, right? Which means they must have the same structure. But, like in the previous cases we saw, we want to see if these two types are structurally the same. So then we got to sign one. We don't have that. Exactly, yeah, so we don't have that. They're two anonymous types, right? We have no idea. Or even their name types that are different. Yeah. I would say for the internal structure, every element has to be name equivalent to the other structure. So if it's. Ooh. Doesn't necessarily have to be in the same order, but if it's two ints in type A and, and A and B in both structures, regardless of what their order is, then they're the same. Yeah, so let's think about this. So we have two structures, right? So we have structure two, which has fields x1, <laughs> which have type w1, and we have structure two, which has fields y1 through yk and types q1 through qk, right? So the first thing that makes sense, right, is that the number of elements of records in the struct, of fields in the struct, have to be the same, right? So this is why we have the k here. So k means they have the exact same number of fields. So there's actually, well, a couple different ways to think about this. Um, so we'll, we say that, OK, two structures are structurally equivalent. And now it really depends, right? So, uh, so there's actually two ways to think about this, right? What is a structure? Is a structure is are the fields and the field names of the structure more important than the order? So what do I mean by you that? Mean what order? Fields are defined in. Let's think about this. Give it a name. So I have an int uh, called A, and I have a, what's something that's definitely not an int? Char. Uh, mm. <laughs> well, yeah, good point. <laughs> there we go. So there's string B, right? So I have struct foo, and I have a struct bar. So, are these structurally equivalent? Yeah. yeah. Arguments for both? Yeah. So when you call upon elements of, of a struct, it doesn't really matter where it is. You just call struct dot whatever you're looking for. In an array, in an array it matters. So I think, I think of a struct kind of like an array in this case, where it has an index and it's in a specific, specified order. That does matter, but because this is... But is the name just an alias for the index? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, these two structs could potentially be different sizes based on the length of the string. Ah, let's, let's say that a string is like a pair pointer, so it's only, it's only a fixed. But yeah, that is a good point, right? If that was a dynamically sized uh, thing. Yeah. I guess it would depend on the language, I would say, but to be honest with you, when C, I don't think this would be I would say the throw an error that this struct, uh, if you would like put them as equal, you would say um, error because it's expecting struct uh, with int string, and you gave it a struct string in. So that would be an error in C. And like for example, in C sharp, it would be the same thing. But there are languages in, in which these two are equivalent if the int A and int A in both situations is the same, and then the string are the same length as he said because the length is. Say they're equivalent, and then you try to use byte offsets instead of like the arrow or the dot to access them. You can run into problems. You have to like disallow that. Yeah. Okay. So this is actually where we get into kind of um, what is a struct, <laughs> right? Like abstractly, a struct just groups <laughs> types types together, right? And it gives us a way to reference each of those grouped types. 
So actually, abstractly, uh, I would say that, yeah, you'd actually kind of want these maybe to be the same type, right? Uh, the problem is once you can start thinking concretely, right, about how this is actually implemented. So in C, right, a struct is just a contiguous chunk of memory. So if we said that this string was actually a char star, this would be uh, four bytes for a character pointer and then four bytes for an int. Right, so this is, uh, what is it, uh, contiguous memory. And the other way, right, we have an int uh, followed by a character pointer. Right. So in C, the way it's actually implemented, the names mean nothing. It's the order that means the most, right, because this character point, right, the int is a sec essentially, it's kind of like thinking about it as an array, right? The int is the second element of this structure, but the int here is the first element of this structure. So trying to assign these to each other or copy one to the other into the memory is going to completely mess things up. Um, it's like a key. In what sense? Which is a key? They're both different keys. Uh, They're both, uh, so the problem is the order here, right? So uh, this is the way we're going to think about structs is this kind of C style, where the order of the elements in the structure matters more than the name. And in fact, the name doesn't matter at all, right? So in our structural equivalents, these would not be structurally equivalent because the order is different. But if we had, The order is the key. The order is the key, yes, and only the order. So if I had some struct bar that was an int uh, d and a string e, right, would these be structurally equivalent? Yes. <laughs> yes, because at each, so they have the same number of elements, and each element, the types are structurally equivalent, right? We have an int, we have an int. We have a string, we have a string. These are structurally equivalent, yeah. So, so though they are structurally equivalent, what if you don't want them to actually be able to be become equivalent? Oh, uh, you can't. <laughs> All right. That's, you'd have to have some way in your type system to construct a new type that is like different from an int. Um, kind of like a new basic type in some sense. But in structural equivalence, just on its own, you could. Okay. Uh, but the, I, I mean, more the idea is looking at this idea of how do we define if two uh, type, types in this sense, but also data structures kind of, right? If they have the same. So this is exactly what this says is, okay, structure one and structure two, they're structurally equivalent if and only if W1, which is the type of the first field, is structurally equivalent to Q1. And the same thing of W2 is structurally equivalent to Q2, and so on and so forth, all the way to, to to W, K, and, oh, yeah, W, K, and Q, K, right? So just matching the types. Notice we don't say anything about the names of each structure. We don't care at all about the names here. So we've seen, right, so here we have a structure A, which is an int followed by a float, and a structure B, which is an int followed by a float. So if we declare a variable A called uh, foo and a variable bar with type D, we say, can we do a foo is equal to bar? Yep. Yep. Yes. So specifically note, even though the names, right, are <coughs> completely backwards and weird, right, the types, the types are the important thing here. And the same thing as we just looked like, right, if we have an int and a float, and a float and an int, uh, because the order is the important thing here, these are not going to be structurally equivalent. <coughs> are there compilers that will optimize the order of struts so that they don't like waste memory? Uh, usually no. Yeah, no. Uh, well, the, the size would still be the same regardless of what order it is. Yes, it but oftentimes sense. you need to be able to, in C, you have to be able to cast a random memory to a structure to be able to interpret that. So that's like a lot of the networking protocols, when you get a packet in, yeah. you cast it to that struct because you know the first two bytes should be this field and the next three bytes are this field, so you represent it as a struct. 
but really it's just a sequence of bytes that came off the wire. And so that's how you actually interpret it. Um, so oftentimes, I mean, theoretically they could, but I don't think in C, and it could be a keyword you can specify that says like never change this structure's layout. Okay. Um, yeah, I can't, okay. And so arrays are done very similarly. So if we have two arrays, right? Uh, T1, which is an array of range one, T2 is array of range two. We'd say they're structurally equivalent if uh, the ranges are the same, right? The ranges have the same number of dimensions and the same number of elements, right? Which makes sense. And T1 and T2, right? The types of whatever are inside the arrays are structurally equivalent. Okay. So the sizes are the same and the What's order? inside them? The inside. order doesn't really matter, right? Because array, everything inside an array is the same type. So we're saying that the, array, the type of everything inside both arrays must be the same. Okay. So the last thing, functional equivalence. So we say that two functions are functionally equivalent. If So we have two functions, right? So what would you guess? What are some of the conditions here? the types of the orders for the parameter list are the same and yeah. if they return the same thing. Yeah, right? It, uh, it is the same. It's, it follows very similarly, right? So A, it has to have the same number of parameters, right? So we have to have K, so the same number of parameters and all the types of the parameters are structurally equivalent, right, in the order and the return types are structurally equivalent. Cool. Uh, okay. An extension of array. Uh, well, it's an extension, kind of. Actually, you can think about an array that map is a function that maps an int to the type of the array. But, anyways. Uh, okay, so when we come back, oh god, it'll be next week, we'll do how to determine structural equivalence, because we'll see. It's actually not as straightforward as we just saw, because we can have recursive types, right? We can have types that refer to other types that refer to the back to themselves, so how do we determine structural equivalence in that case?